This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. From many people's perspective, Ed McGlasson was living a full life, a career in the NFL, a wife and children. But during this time, Ed learned an important lesson in what makes a good father, not only for earthly fathers, but how we relate to our heavenly father. He's the author of the book, How to Become the Husband and Father Your Family Needs. Hey, this is the first time, by the way, uh, I've ever interviewed a center. I played center my whole life from Pee Wee all, th all the way through college, and <laughs> never have I been able to interview another center. So thank you. Hey, well, you know what? You know that the, the most athletic and the smartest guy on the team is the center. Uh, yeah, I, see, I wasn't told that until I got out of college. <laughs> yeah, I had to make, I had to listen to the quarterback. <clears throat> snap the ball, root out the nose guard, and make line calls right and left yep. based on where the, where the strong side backers were. Yep. Hey, the, the difference the father makes, the father you always wanted, the blessings of the father for families. Uh, Ed McGlasson is, was an NFL football player, tr transitioned to a successful pastor, wife, five kids, three boys and two girls. You would expect him to be the quintessential father. But Ed discovered a hole in his life that was left by his own father, and that was keeping him from being the husband and the father that his family needs. That's the name of his new book, How to Become the Husband and the Father Your Family Needs. Ed, glad to have you here today. It's an honor to be with you, Bob. Hey, that is, that is a lot of identities. Uh, you, I mean, you grow up, uh, you kind of into football your whole life, uh, go to Youngstown State, play football there, you're a star there on the line, offensive line. Uh, get drafted in the NFL, and then that comes to an end, your identity changes. Tell me about all these identities you've been through in your life getting to become a father. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you use that word. Uh, God's made us to carry an identity. And um, for so much of my early story, I thought that if I could just become a professional football player, everything would change. So I I ate like one. <laughs> yeah. I tried to act like one. I played the most athletic position on the field. And you told me before we started this uh, interview that you were a center too. Absolutely. So, you know, yep. you got to be able to snap the ball between your legs, root out a 350 pound uh, water balloon in front of you, <laughs> yep. which is a tough nose guard, which I played against Mean Joe Green in those that's, days. And then an make line calls, listen to the quarterback, snap the ball and not be uh, pushed back on your duff. So it was a pretty busy job, but I, I loved playing center. Yep, and then you played at Youngstown State. Something happened there that really changed the trajectory of your life, though, and, it's, and it uh, changed it to where you thought, this is where I need to be, but at the same time, God has something for you later on in your life. Tell me what happened at Youngstown State. Well, you know, when, when I was growing up, my mom would talk about my dad. My dad was a, a test pilot in the Navy mm -hmm. on May the 29th, 1956. He had to make a last minute decision to either bail out his plane over Monterey Bay or to ride it in. The problem it was, it was a Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And so my dad uh, realized that his plane was going to glide into the beaches. So he turned it to sea. The beach is loaded. He with hit people, his right? helmet. The beach is loaded. It's filled people. with people. Yeah. Memorial Day weekend, and his last words on earth before he crashed were, this is November Papa riding it in. Wow. So my dad hit the water, and I lost my dad. I was still, you know, inside my mom at the time. He died about a month before I was born. And so I was, I was raised with um, trying to be a hero like my dad mm -hmm. in every kind of way. And one of the dreams that he... Uh, wasn't able to realize because he hurt his knee at the Naval Academy playing football. He wanted to be a pro football player. So my mother, <laughs> we were growing up, football was like bigger than football. It was the, the whole persona, <laughs> identity. And, you know, she would say to me, she her voice would quiver. And she'd go, you know, your dear father, he had one dream left. That if he could play professional football and see it's and, and you could fulfill that for him, he would be so proud. 
And I'd look at it and that screws up a kid. I was, I had a dead dad watching me. I didn't have much of a relationship with God and went to, ended up long story short, ended up at Youngstown State University with offensive line coach, Bob Dove and Bill Narduzzi, the head coach. And, and there I was my sophomore year and a young rookie dove through my knee to get a fumble between my legs. Uh, and I heard my ligaments snap. Oh, and I've they heard rushed that sound me to the before, hospital. Yeah. The doctor comes out of the examination room, looks at me and says, I was on a gurney. He said, um, don't need anything after 12. Uh, we're going to do major reconstructive surgery in the morning. There goes the football career. You have torn all three major <clears throat> ligaments. And so I was, I was, I was done. Mm -hmm. And I remember going back to my dorm room and I, I wept. And we had not even lost a football game. <laughs> there was not much crying allowed yeah. in my family. And so, you know, here I was uh, just, you know, laying there on the, um, on my bed and a guy knocks on the door and his name was Bill. And uh, he was a campus minister and he walks in and he goes, Ed, you got everything going for you, but you lack one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, Jesus Christ. And I looked at him and I pointed at my knee that was surrounded with ice bags. Mm -hmm. And I said, what about this? And he, and, and he didn't answer my question. He just opened his Bible and read John 3.16. Well, I had seen John 3.16 in stadiums yeah, the with the guy up. with yep. the big rainbow the big hair. Sign. Yeah. I, I, had, I didn't know if that's where the John was where he went to the bathroom. <laughs> I had no idea. I'm not a church kid, right? Yeah. And so he reads that verse, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Bob what the scripture describes in Hebrew is that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. When I heard those words in my ears, I, 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 I understood what it meant. It's like God opened my heart for the first time. Well, that's gotta be supernatural revelation. I mean, it's just, I mean, a college kid and usually you'd argue with the guy, but in this case it was revealed to you by the Lord. Yeah. And right in that moment, you know, he, I said, <laughs> so what do I do? Great question. And he said, um, you know, if you'll ask Jesus in your life and ask him to receive you, uh, do you receive what he did for you? You'll be saved. I said, well, how does that work? He said, when D Jesus died on the cross, he died as though he were you. So that when you receive his mercy, you can live as though you were him. Good. And I just, I <sighs> knew it. Wow. And I prayed this really simple prayer. You know, Jesus, forgive me of my sin for, you know, come into my life and, and be my savior. And then he looks at me and goes, can I pray for your knee? And he was a, he was the campus pastor for the Presbyterian church. So he actually didn't even really believe that God healed the sick, but he just, he was just going to pray for it. Yeah. Yeah. He just going to pray for me. What, <laughs> you know, let me try it. So he put his hand on my ice bag and I didn't feel anything because my knee was frozen. And the next morning they woke me up. I'd had the most peaceful sleep I'd ever had that night. And they put me on a gurney and rolled me in to pre-op and shaved my leg and put on that dress that doesn't tie in the back on a normal sized guy. And, <laughs> and a uh, normal size guy. Prepared, yeah. Prepared my knee for surgery. And, uh, the, uh, doctor said, we're going to do one more test because they didn't have scope back then. It was mm -hmm. all, you know, evasive surgery. And uh, he comes back out after doing an, an orthogram test where they put a camera inside your knee. And he goes, Ed, I don't understand this, but somehow all the ligaments that were torn yesterday wow. have been reattached. That is amazing. And you've been healed. And so I went on this walk and I, I'm going, what do you want me to do? And this voice breaks through in that moment into my heart and it just stops me this internal voice from the Lord. And he said, I want you to fulfill your dream and play professional football. Wow. And I was just amazing. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? How do you know me? <laughs> yeah. I, 
I if and I actually yeah I looked up because I thought maybe God was up you know in those days <laughs> yeah and I said if I knew you were this cool I'd have got saved a long time ago <laughs> why did I wait and 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 the Lord just stomps me and goes well who do you think put that in your heart when you were a kid and I realized that He has always been you know after me. But God did say something else to you there. I mean, when he told you that he gave you that dream, he also said that the dream wasn't forever, didn't he? No, he did. He said, but when I call for it back, I want you to give it up. Did you have any idea what that meant? I had no idea. Well, well, tell me about about uh, what Bill said, Pastor Bill. When you went back to him after the healing, you went back to him, you called him up and said, now what do I do? What what did he tell you? First, Bill said, you got what? You got healed? <laughs> I've never prayed for anybody got healed before. And so, I mean, he was all excited, yelling for Donna, saying, Donna, 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 Eddie got healed. She said, what? You know, and here, here's a guy who was a dispensationalist at the time, which actually didn't believe mm-hmm. that people got healed. Right. That was what Jesus did in his day. And so then I asked him what to do, and he said, well, take that book, go into the quad, find somebody, and lead him to Christ. That's what he told me. Big and assignment for a new Christian. Okay. I, I, I'm a brand new Christian. I don't even own a Bible yet. I only know one verse. <laughs> John 3.16. What, what, what else do you little, need to know? Little, little, little right. <laughs> That's it. And so I'm walking around going, who? And there's this girl named Karen who was in my physics class. <clears throat> and she was really cute. So I'm thinking... Well, shouldn't God want to save a cute girl? Sure. Let me try that one. <laughs> and so I sat down. I was so nervous, Bob, because if she would have asked me one question, and so I said, have you heard of the four spiritual laws? And she goes, well, yeah, she's studying physics. Oh. But she think I'm talking about class talk. Law number one. And I just read through this little pamphlet from Bill Bright and I don't think I even looked up. I was so nervous. And I got to the very end, about 15 pages later, I said, if you'd like to receive Jesus in your life as your Savior, pray this prayer, dear Jesus. And I heard, dear Jesus, and I looked up, and she was weeping. Oh, wow. And I just went, I didn't know then what I know now. That evangelism isn't about what you do to get somebody saved. It's about creating an opportunity for somebody. So Jesus shows up and he saves them. And so I called Bill back on the phone and I said, hey, Bill, guess what? He said, what, Eddie? I mean, you just got healed. I go, well, I got one. What'd you get? A girl. He goes, that's what they get a girl. I said, no, 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 no. You know the book? Four Spiritual Laws? He goes, yeah. Did you lead someone to Christ? I said, well, yeah, you told me to. I'm a football player, and if a coach says run, I run. And so that year, I had 115 different students I shared that book with and prayed with them to receive Christ. Football became the vehicle, though, because even into the NFL, you were continuing to lead people to Christ. Yeah, we, you know, I was, uh, I was part of the early group of guys that went to the 50 yard line mm-hmm. and, um, uh, George Martin and Bill Currier and I and the giants would go out and get it, uh, take a knee out there. And it wasn't a protest. It was, we're, we're all letting everybody know that the reason we play this football game is because we love Jesus. Up until then, your life had all been about football and then that came to an end as well. Uh, there's an, another identity change coming is, is God requires that gift back, that dream back, and takes yeah. you on to a new, a new area in your life. And that's, that's as a, a very successful pastor. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, God then, you know, calls me into the ministry. I start out as an evangelist, and my, my first ministry name was the Heaven on Earth Ministries. <laughs> <laughs> Got to share my testimony and do some of the pre-events for Billy Graham uh, crusades and went to colleges and high schools and shared my testimony and have an altar call and see these kids get saved. And then we'd take them to the stadium and fill up the stadium and Billy would come out and do his thing. And A lot of identity changes. And through all those changes, people think, well, 
he had to be a great dad. I mean, you got this smile, you got this energy, you played <laughs> football, uh, you were a successful pastor. You must have been really had fatherhood nailed. You had five kids, and you woke up. I mean, you, 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 uh, something happened with one of your, your, your oldest child that all of a sudden yeah. you, you went back to God and said, what am I doing? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I wish I could tell you that I um, handled fatherhood like I did the bench press or playing in the NFL or even preaching, you know, which was my sweet spot. Mm -hmm. But I, I struggled as a dad, like many men do, not because I didn't love my children. Is because, you know, intrinsically I knew I didn't have much of a blessing to give them because I never got one. Because as a man, and I write about it in my books, we can only give away those things that we've received. We're, God's made us to be a word-activated human being, right? Mm -hmm. So the words over us really determine how we see ourselves as men. So if you don't have a dad who knows how to speak life into you because his dad never spoke life into him, well, guess what he doesn't do? He doesn't tell you those things he loves about you. He doesn't call you out and bless you because he doesn't carry it himself. That's why shaming men who are never blessed even drives men further away from God and further away from families because, you know, they want to be good fathers, but they struggle because so many of them, and I did, I carried around this wound in me um, from my, my own stepdad at times and, and the loss of my father, I just didn't feel like I had much to give my kids. And it became apparent one day, Bob, when my son Edward didn't um, do what I wanted him to do. And I, I said some horrible things to him. I broke that promise that I wouldn't ever speak down to him. And I just, I just drilled him. And he was crying in the room right next to my ear right next to my studio here at my house. And I could hear him crying. And I just, I just went to the Lord. I said, why did I do that, Lord? And the father just shows up in that moment. He says, the reason why you did that is because that's the way you talk to yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah. And see, I, I, I'd learned how to hear even God's voice uh, in, in the way he spoke in scripture to me. I would, I was really good at finding all the scriptures where I was broken, right? I didn't know how to receive, you know, from, you know him as a father. And, and I just devastated Edward. And then he said this to me, if you'll learn how to hear the voice of the father, like Jesus did, then I'll, sh I'll, I'll help you become the father, the kind of father that makes a difference. And I just, I was undone, Bob, because God showed me my identity or my, my desire for it. Mm -hmm. So the man, when he's not clear about who he is, you know, carries around the curse that Adam did, where we get our identity from the sweat of our brow, the trophies on our mantle, the jobs we build, the projects we do, the hobbies we have, something external to us because internally we're not clear about who we are because our dads didn't know how to bless us. And so, you know, I realized right in that moment that I, I wanted to be fathered by God the same way Jesus was. And God spoke, he was the most yeah. complete man who ever lived. And God spoke that blessing over Christ when he came out of the water when he was, when he was baptized. Yeah, I had, I had taught that for years, Bob, until one day I asked this question, why did he call him beloved? I mean, he could, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I love. And Jesus comes out of the water in front of John the Baptist. And so I, I didn't know. So I, uh, I had two 56K baud modems. So we're <laughs> dating ourselves right now. I had a pancake together and I searched the internet at the time really slow for the ancient rites of bar mitzvah. I thought maybe the Jewish culture knew about this. Because when does a boy become a man? That was my question. <clears throat> yeah. How can I become a man without my dad there living to bless me? How can I get rid of this constant place that I was as a man of making everything about me? That thing the Lord spoke to me in that moment with my son Edward, I realized that my, my house was all about me. 
My career was all about me. My church was all about me. It was all about me trying to arrive and attain something. Mm -hmm. I mean, the NFL was, you know, it's like, if I can get, get this identity, then I arrive. The problem is, you know, I, I would arrive with these guys and make the team and we'd look at one another in the locker room. It's like, well, what's next? Yeah. Well, if I can just win the Super Bowl, yeah. one more there's thing. always this next goal. Yeah. And so you never get to arrive. And the problem is that when a man's heart is not settled and who God says that he is, then he'll spend his whole life, his resources, his money, his time, pushing his family, trying to get to that place where he can finally say, this is who I am. Well, in, in, that, in, enough. in that Jewish bar mitzvah, it's when that child turns 13, the father is, is, is blessing him with, that, with that, uh, that blessing. With you, then that's, that's the passage from, from childhood or sonhood to, to manhood. That didn't happen until you were 40 years old. A scripture that my dad read the night before he crashed. Oh you know, the night before he died and she was pregnant with me, he was reading his Bible, takes out a red pen, circles a word in the Bible, closes it, has a strange look on his face, and my mom, who's a Navy pilot's wife, looks at him with this fear that's always in her. She said, am I going to lose you? And my dad said, well, well, why? You, would you say that? She said, really strange look on your face. Well, my mother, when upon hearing about his death, ran back to the bureau next to the bed and grabbed his Bible. And it was the story of Jesus walking on the water towards the disciples on the boat. And Peter sees him, first thinks he's a ghost because yeah. nobody walks on the water. And I think Jesus was going up and down the wave. So he was disappearing and appearing as he was walking towards disciples. Yeah. And and Peter says, if it's really you, command me to walk on the water. And Jesus said, come. That was the word, Bob, my dad circled in the Bible. Forty years later, I'm in front of these high school kids reading this story, thinking about teaching them the, to keep their eyes on Jesus, even though a wave comes in front of them and they get afraid, and he'll be there to help you to, in whatever he's called you to do. So that was sort of my little sermon. But when I read that story, all I can tell you is that the father I never got to have, God the Father, showed up in that morning and said these words to me, deep in my soul. He said, the last word your dad heard was a word come. That's what I've called you to do, Ed. He's called Call people. people to come to me. And then he said, from this moment on, your name is no longer football player, pastor. It's no longer about what you do for a living. You are my beloved son that I love. Again, we're speaking with Ed McGlasson, author of How to Become the Husband and Father Your Family Needs. In a moment, I'll ask him to give us a few points on how we can do just that. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Well, Ed, when we look through this book, there's just a lot of practical information in here, a lot of good tips for fathers and a lot of direction. But if you were going to lay out one first step for, for fathers to take, one major step that you think is going to make the biggest difference in their family, what would that be? Well, it, it has a, in the whole area, you know, bitterness is what's killing our families right now. It's what's killing our world. And the father in the family is the one who sets the culture of forgiveness yeah. or bitterness. 
and I talk about this in my book and being able to, and, and what I had to learn to d understand was that I was the guy who needed to model how to even ask mm -hmm. for forgiveness with my children. Because I remember listening to my kids and they were little at the time and they were making fun of one another. This passive aggressive talk, kind of mm -hmm. like we did in the locker room. Yeah. And, and then they would go, just kidding. And, but I, hear, I would hear them cry. My daughters would run their room. My sons would run their room. Doors were being slammed all the time. And I realized right in that moment, I'm listening. I taught them how to make fun of one another. I taught them how to do this. And I said, Lord, how do I fix this? He said, oh, you know, he, he just, he, he, I want you to go in there and ask them to forgive you for the way you've talked to them. <laughs> And I mean, I, I walked in there and I was like, guys, I need to have a family meeting. And um, I, I want you to forgive me because I've, uh, I've taught you how to make fun of one another and you're destroying your relationships with one another that one day after I'm gone, you won't want to spend any time together. Will you forgive me, Edward, for saying this today? Jessica, Mary, Lucas, Josh, and they were, they were first, they were just shocked. Sure. And, and they said, yes, dad. And it, it changed the culture of my family. And so one of the things I, I talk about in the book is that the guy who gets to set the culture of forgiveness is always the father. No matter how you had a dad in your story, if you'll learn to set the culture of forgiveness by first, you got to receive it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yep. And most men are bitter because they've never truly received God's forgiveness. Maybe you're in that place today and uh, you're listening to this show and your wife says, honey, come over here and look at this. You really need to look at it and you're going, I don't want to look at it, but I really need it. And maybe you have never given your life to and never receive God's mercy completely for yourself. You've tried everything, but you know during this crazy time we have in our country, your 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 family's broken, and you know that you had a part of that. Well, here's a, just a simple little prayer. If you'll just go right now, you can even pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, uh, I give you my family back. Would you teach me? how to lead them in forgiveness. Would you forgive me for the things that I've done? And would you give me the family that I, I dreamed about when I was thinking about having a family? And would you heal our family today? In Jesus' name. Many thanks to Ed McGlasson. He has a podcast and several books all designed to help you be a better parent to your children. And forgiveness is the key. If you need to know more about the forgiveness found in Jesus Christ as your savior, you can find out more information at WTLW.com. Thanks for joining me today.